when we thought you were coming to developing partnerships by hosting a family and professional partnership conference, you're in the right place. So can we have someone to say, let's say you're just a minute. You're from a Okay. Okay. Thank you to get to know you. And Cynthia is from Oklahoma. Okay, Washington State. Washington State. Massachusetts, Massachusetts, Texas, nice. What's the name of her? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. All right, we've got people. They should learn just about. All right. So here's our learning objectives today to increase awareness of the importance of family and professional partnerships, identify potential partners for your own conference. Future family leadership activities and possible future funding. I guess I better get in front of my mic. Um, receive tools to plan and execute a family professional partnerships conference and then to learn details for increasing family partnerships in the development, implementation, and evaluation of programs. So Heather and I have been out this quite a while. Um, we actually wrote the Family and Family Health Information Center grant, which is a grant through Human Service, Human Resources Services Administration back in 2007. And we received it in 2008, and it's competitive every time we write for it, but thankfully, no one has written that for the news yet. But the year before um, we wrote that grant, we got really involved with our Title V. Title five serves families and children with regard to health. And so in our state, it's run by the Department of Health and Department of Human Services, Children with Special Health Care Needs. Um, and so what happened was I had the opportunity of attending the Association for Maternal and Child Health Programs National Conference and I knew for Lisa was the keynote, one of the keynotes that year. And I knew he's a very well-known family advocate of really training families and youth at being their own best advocate, but then also advocating for others, um, whether the child has special health care needs or not. She's done it very in a civic-minded way across the state of Denver, excuse me, Colorado. And, um, and so they have developed this amazing leadership training program that is even available today. And um, so we have the privilege of actually hearing Eileen talk about family professional partnerships and how certain agencies have family professional councils or advisories. And so when I walked out of that session, I looked at my leaders, they were all kind of, you know, from all the agencies were standing there together. And I said, tell me about our Title V advisory. And they all looked at their shoes. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. They all looked straight down at their shoes. And I said, we don't have one, do we? I mean, the way that you talked about it, I thought everybody had one. Well, not everybody has one. We still don't have one in Oklahoma. Although our family to family advisory kind of serves in the role of our Title V advisory. I think we could probably say that now. So when I left MCHIP, I said, we have to do this. I mean, Heather and I already wanted to do it. We were the parent to parent in Oklahoma, and we were writing for the Family to Family Health Information Center. About 40% of the calls at that time that we received were from families who had kids with some kind of challenging behaviors or a behavioral health concern. And we knew that if families didn't have a voice at the table, then the services that were being delivered were not going to be what families needed. And one of the ways, I'm a middle child. I tell people this all the time. When you're a middle child, one of the things that you want to do is you want everybody to be happy. And so you just run around all the time and try to figure out how can I keep peace in my home and keep everyone happy. And, um, and I said, you know, Heather, you know, we get along great. We get along really well with all of the family organizations. You know, we had Down Syndrome Association. We had Autism Networks. You know, we had all these family networks. And we all really got along pretty well. And we kind of figured out, you know, if we get a family who has a child with autism, we help them somewhat. But we want to make sure they're also connected to the Autism Network so that they can be with families that are like-minded, very similar experiences and that kind of thing. And so here we have all these family organizations. Now we just need to get the agencies together and bring them all under one roof 
and figure out how can we work together better. And so we actually brought in Family Voices National uh, Office, their technical assistance group, and two of their staff came in and they helped us do strategic planning around Family Voice. How can we get Family Voice at our child serving agencies, but specifically our Title V, which again was Department of Health, and then DHS, uh, Children with Special Health Care Needs, but the Health Care Authority, our Medicaid agency, was also involved because those three agencies have always worked very closely together. And so we actually left that day with some really good to-dos. And one was to have a joining forces supporting family professional partnerships conference. And then the other was they, they supported Heather and myself in writing the Family to Family Health Information Center. So that's kind of how the joining forces uh, plan grew. Did I miss anything? Okay. Because I sure can't see that. <laughs> um, so why have a conference? Well, I will tell you this. We planned that conference over about six months. And so that means six months out of the year, every child and family serving agency is in a meeting with Heather, with myself, with our staff, and with other family leaders, because we targeted family leaders with expertise in different agencies, because my children have never been on Sooner Care. So I can't really be a good voice for Sooner Care. But... My kids have had behavioral health services. My kids have been on IEPs. They've been on 504s. Um, they have all kinds of health care needs. They've had surgeries and all this kind of thing. So I can speak into the health system and the mental health system, but I'm not going to be the best family voice for Sooner Care, which is Medicaid in Oklahoma. And so we thought, let's bring all these people together. Let's have every agency talk about what they're doing around getting family and youth, um, parent voice, uh, the person that they're serving's voice, um, the service recipient. Let's get them all together. Have the agency leaders talk about what they're doing in this arena. And then we had these breakouts where these round tables and each agency, this was the first year, each agency had their own table. So the keynote basically was Eileen Forlinza talking about why are these partnerships important? What should they look like? Families should be compensated for their time, all that good stuff. And then the agencies did a panel and they talked about how they were using the voice of the people they were serving. And then in the afternoon, each agency had their own table and we rotated. So families could go to three tables and the agency agency people. So like sewer care or Medicaid have their own table, but they might have five staff there. And so some of those staff could rotate. So not only were they hearing how the families could get involved in those agencies, but they also could hear how agencies could do some cross agency work. Do you have a question? No question, but I'm just really, I was, I was making a note when you first started talking about like that structural process. Yes. And then when I took that in, I, 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 I realized that I wanted to return to the but I didn't want to ask that, so that's the reason I say it. The reason why I say that is because I just participated in something similar, but it was on the local level. And while I was there, I was thinking, this would be amazing if it wasn't just the people in my state doing this, but the people across the state doing this. And so when I took that in, I realized that you you're really that yeah. And so that looks like that. Okay. Exactly. Like Where are you? Super. Doing? And I wanted to, if you don't mind, can you, can you discuss what that looks like? You just what you were just talking. We're going to get it. We're going to get into a lot more detail. In fact, we have a toolkit that we'll share with you all that you can download. It's in a Google Doc, so it'll be on the screen here in just a little bit. And you can download that, and it. It is like paint by number, <laughs> you know, you just, we get, we are giving you everything that we've created over the last 16 years as we've done this conference that many times. And I think what you'll find, and, and we're going to save time for questions because we have an hour and a half. Um, and so we're more than glad for you to ask questions, but I have a feeling as we walk through this, you're going to get a lot more detail. I just thought it was important for you to hear why the heck did we do this? You know, we did not have a voice at most tables. 
you know, usually what was happening in Oklahoma is we would come in and everything would be decided and they would go, don't you like our brochure? And they really didn't want to know that you didn't like it. You know, and you didn't get to talk about the program, you only got to talk about the brochure. Well, that's about the lowest level of family input that you can get or youth input. I mean, it's a piece, don't get me wrong. It's a place to start, but it is not the be all and end all by any means. What state are you from? Georgia. Georgia, good. Yeah, half of the conference is from Georgia. Okay, I think, I think we're, I think we're ready to go. So this next graphic just kind of um, laid out that partnership building process. So the first thing that we did was we just identified existing opportunities for involvement within services and systems. And really, you guys, that's done by building relationships. Um, we all know that relationships are key to most everything we do and that communication and trust and all of that goes into building those um, um, partnerships and just identifying those existing opportunities. So really it's that low hanging fruit, you know, what you already, what you already have access to and, and, and tr people that trust you. And then the next um, piece of that is just identifying individuals and families that are interested in the opportunities. So Joni had mentioned, um, you know, she has experience with, you know, certain things within the healthcare system or the school system or whatever, but we really needed representation from lots of different families with, with lots of different experiences. And our philosophy and our mentality in regards to that is we've all been given experiences and, you know, situations in our life, not just to hold on to for ourselves, but to share with others, to try to make a difference, to try to give them hope, to share with agencies that are working with our children and our families, to try to make things better for those that are coming along behind us. And then the third piece of that is just identifying training and information um, that's already available. Um, there's no point in recreating the wheel. So if something's already available that's going to be, you know, help you fulfill this and, and build those partnerships, use it. If you find that there are things that need to be developed, that's when you work with your partners and family leaders to start developing those pieces. And then the last part is, um, you know, just make sure that individuals and families are more aware and available of the services and supports that are available to them. How many of you in here are parents? Yeah. When you got a diagnosis for your child, how overwhelming was that? And the time that it takes to research the diagnosis, to find out what services are, all the state agencies that, you know, have services that your child may benefit from, but they're all in silos. They're not all connected in some way. And so as a family member, it's frustrating to have to dig and try to find all that on your own. And so this really, um, you know, just kind of pulls that all together and um, just tries to help pave that path for others. And that's working through partnership. So building the planning committee, um, what we did, you know, we just started with those we had relationships with. Um, and those that we didn't necessarily have relationships with, we met them for coffee, we met them for lunch, you know, we did all those things and just used our connections within other um, state agencies and leadership um, and just said, you know, we're missing somebody from this agency. Who do you know? Who do you recommend? And then we just started, you know, reaching out to them and and building upon those. And we actually made a list of family leaders that we knew. So we gathered a bunch of family leaders and said, okay, who do we know? And then who do those people know? So if I didn't know anyone from Department of Rehabil Rehabilitation Services, which I didn't, then who knows someone there? And then that's how we just started gathering those together. The families would kind of meet, and then we would start meeting with the agencies. We would do our reconnaissance behind the scenes. And we usually debriefed after the meetings, too, with families to see how they were feeling and decide, what do we need to do before the next? I mean, we know the professionals do that all the time, right? They're always talking about us. So we just kind of did the same thing, kind of figure things out. And then another big piece of that is not just state agencies and leadership within the state agencies, but other nonprofits, like Joni mentioned, 
partnering together with the Down Syndrome Association, with the, your Heartland Regional Genetics, with your mental health services, with wraparound, you know, just bringing all those pieces together that are family and individual serving agencies and organizations. Um, you know, we, we're a nonprofit. We've been in existence for 25 years, and we do not care who gets the credit for, the, for helping the family, right? As long as the family gets what they need, and we all have to work together to make sure that happens. We can't be the, you know, fix all, do all for everyone. We have to partner with other organizations. To Even do the name of the conference, the committee decided upon it. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't say Oklahoma Family Networks Joining Forces Conference. It's just the Joining Forces Supporting Family Professional Partnerships yeah. Conference. It's it was important. Yeah, it is. It is. And then um, Joni had already kind of talked about, you know, just how we gathered family leaders and things like that. Um, we're really, we were having a conversation with Massachusetts, just identifying younger family leaders too. I think that's a big focus for us right now because, you know, we're not going to be, I mean, we probably will be doing this forever, maybe not as a job, but we have kiddos still um, and grandkids coming up. So we'll always be advocates and we'll always be involved in this work, but we need to identify those younger family leaders that are going to be a voice at the table and we can kind of take under our wings and kind of mentor them through, you know, the work and the foundation that we've laid. We want that to continue in our state and in our nation. And your early intervention programs and your head starts are a really good place to get those younger families. Yes, absolutely. This is just an example of like our a conference agenda that we've done. Um, this was from 2019. So this was pre-COVID. Um, we've had this conference and um, this is our 16th year um, for 2023. This will be our 16th Joining Forces Conference. Um, and so in 2019, we had our typical in person, we typically have, you know, 150 to 175 people attend in person. And then in 2020, three weeks before the conference was planned, that's when COVID happened. So we did a really quick shift and went to um, virtual and did everything on Zoom and um, it was very successful. Um, but our agenda looks a little bit different, um, you know, for in-person than it would have for, you know, converting everything over to virtual. Um, but we just start off the day typically with like a keynote speaker and sometimes that's someone that's local within our state that's a great leader or um, just has, you know, a great voice um, in regards to partnership and um, working together. And sometimes we've had funding through our partners and through fundraising or whatever to bring in a national speaker. So every year it's just really a little different, um, but we utilize our planning committee to identify kind of what we want to see happen this year, what our focus is. Our focus is always that family professional partnership, but sometimes there's a little different theme that goes along with it. This year we have a, a local um, leader, um, an agency actually organization, I guess, university affiliate, um, who's going to be our keynote speaker. She basically offered to do it for us because she's really passionate about the conference and what we do. So we're not going to have to pay her. She's local. Yeah. Why not feature someone local? And she's going to talk about the seven partnership values that their organization created in partnership with families and other leaders in our state. So we're gonna kind of this year, just really jump back to some of the basics of partnering and really bring along some of those younger families as well as new agency leadership. We've had a lot of turnover, you know, with leadership within our agencies and other organizations. And so we're gonna kind of take a step back and, and just kind of start with that this coming um, March 31st. So, and then in the afternoon, um, we usually have breakout sessions. Um, we've done little round tables before, like Joni um, talked about earlier in one of the slides. Um, but a lot of times we'll do breakout sessions in rooms very similar to this. And the agency or organization um, typically will bring something to the table that they're working on or they need family voice on. And we really try to model in all of those sessions an agency or organization leader, as well as a family leader that's involved with that agency or organization. So all throughout the conference, we're modeling those two presenting um, together and um, you know, providing those breakout sessions together to get that family voice and input. And really these conferences can be done for just a shoestring budget. You can do it at a church or a school, you know, a place where someone gives you free space. And if, if you have a local leader be the keynote, 
Um, sometimes we've done panels where a family member and then an agency will talk about how they're using families or youth in their organization and what that looks like and how others might get involved in um, the work that's being done. One of the things that we believe in, we write it in every grant and contract that we have, is that we always pay families and youth for their voice. If they're going to come into Joining Forces Conference, you know, we try to have, we ask each agency if they can help provide the cost of hotel rooms, if they'll help provide the cost of transportation, if they'll help provide the cost of childcare, if the family needs it, because we don't want anything to get in the way of the family being able to come. This is a one day conference, but many years we've either done a family leadership institute, like for a half a day, the day before, or maybe the whole day, the day following, or just a general family conference um, like for the whole day on, usually we do it on Fridays. People really like having conferences on Fridays, ends up their week. They can go home when they're finished. It's pretty neat. Um, but it's nice in the years that we've been able to bring the family leaders in early. We have a family gathering dinner. They get to know each other. We don't do a whole lot that night. Although sometimes we've done kind of a mix where you have a family dinner and then you do a little bit of training. Um, we've just done that every single year. I think we've done it a little bit differently. So use your imagination. Talk to the other family leaders. One of the things that we've done is we've actually put a system together to pay family and youth leaders. Um, we used to use just sheets of paper. And then like when they showed up for the meeting, they would sign it. And we would hand them a Walmart gift card for their attendance. But now we've gotten real sophisticated. <laughs> But it's because a lot of this work is being done by Zoom now, and some of it's going back to in-person or hybrid, but a lot of it is staying by Zoom, which saves a lot of money. I don't think it's quite as effective as having a bunch of families and professionals in a room together, but it works. And so what we do is we developed a, we had a document that we turned into a Google form. And so when someone finishes a meeting, we give them a QR code or the link and they just go to that and then they fill this form out. And then if you've not ever used Google forms, it'll actually create a spreadsheet for you. And then we make the payment from that. So we get their name, their address, their phone number, their email address, how long they were there. Um, how much time they prepared ahead of time, just that sort of thing. And um, this document and then all of the others will be available for you um, a little bit later in the presentation. And then this has been uploaded to the um, to Whova um, in Spanish and in English. And so you can download those when you get home too. Yeah, used to, we would email them the form, they'd have to print it. Not everybody, not every family leader has a printer, you know, so we'd have to mail them the sheet. And I believe in paying people the day they do the work, you know, because I want, if they want to go home and get Kentucky Fried Chicken on their way home, instead of having to make dinner, I want them to be able to do that if they want to. So um, another question we had to kind of address was really, where do I find partners and family leaders. So again, just looking at who you're already working with. Um, I know I wouldn't be standing here today if someone didn't like pull me along and say, hey, come and like sit on the interagency coordinating council for Sooner Start. Your son went through early intervention. Like we need a family voice. And I didn't know what the heck I was doing, <laughs> but someone else did. And they really just pulled me along side them and really helped me and nurtured me and guided me and I made mistakes like we all do but that's how we learn um, and so really just identify who you're working with um, every single family I don't care who they are what they're currently going through whatever every family is a leader they're a leader in their home they're a leader in some way somehow and it's our responsibility to help them recognize that and help them build and grow that so just you look around, see who you're already working with and identify them. Um, and then who has similar goals and missions with your organization or the work that you're trying to do? Every single one of our state agencies should have similar goals and missions to what our goal and mission is, right? It's serving families. 
and making sure that what we're doing meets the needs of those families. And then look at partners just across the state. That's another thing too. Um, you know, sometimes we can get so holed in on like our metro areas or whatever. And I think, um, I don't know your name, but from Georgia, you had mentioned like a local community thing. Um, we have got to also recognize that like Oklahoma is a really rural state. And things for rural families and in rural communities, resources are very different. I mean, you know that working, you know, in Okamulgee and in that area. Um, and so we want to identify families, not only from, you know, those, those cities, those metro areas, but identify the family voice from those in rural areas. Our panhandle of Oklahoma is like a different country mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, and if we don't have the representation from that, which is one way that Zoom and doing virtual and or hybrid conferences has been super helpful because we have really captured and identified some families and even professionals um, by converting, you know, and doing that, you know, doing things on Zoom and through um, means of them being able to participate from their home. So we'll continue those efforts, but it's really important to recognize that as well. This one, mine too. <laughs> so some tips for a successful day. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we are prepared. There's a lot of planning that goes into hosting a conference or hosting a training or an event, um, especially where you're bringing together families and professionals in the same environment. Um, so technology is a big piece of that. We always do like a site visit to just kind of check to make sure, you know, they have everything that we need um, and they're easy to work with. And then food, um, if we're going to be providing food, we are joining forces conference is pretty unique. We have never had a registration fee for this conference. We have always worked with partners or done fundraising efforts or, um, you know, worked with our state department of education where they have access to a career tech center. So that cost is covered for us. We've just done lots of different ways of trying to keep those costs down. And we do not want cost, even $10 to some families will keep them from coming. We do not want that to be a barrier. Um, we have on our Eventbrite registration asked for professionals to make a contribution to cover the cost of their lunch, which has never been an issue with any of them. They vary. A lot of times they give above and beyond to cover the cost of a family's lunch. So if we ask for $10, they usually, you know, will kick in 20 or whatever. Um, so food is a big thing, um, but we get all that information up front at registration. Also accommodating, you know, if people are vegetarian or, you know, things like that. That's all in our registration information. Um, registration is a big one. I don't know how many of you, you, how many of you plan events and things like that, but we love to use Eventbrite um, just to capture some demographic information. Um, you can customize your questions. It's free um, for nonprofits to use if you don't have a cost for the ticket. Um, so there's no fees or anything like that associated with that. Um, so we love using that. And then Zoom also has, you know, some, they've kind of upped their game a little bit too on registration. Um, so Zoom is also a way you can customize those questions and things if you're doing something um, through Zoom. And then we, we find it really important. We have a lot of, we have staff and we have a lot of family leaders who, um, you know, speak Spanish or bilingual and prefer things in Spanish. So we make sure that we have interpreters, um, live interpreters. We've had interpreters on Zoom. Last year at our Joining Forces conference, we did a hybrid model. We had one of our interpreters join us from Brazil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, she happens to work for a lady here in Oklahoma, um, contracts with her and she joined us, joined us on Zoom um, from Brazil, and we provided that translation for our Spanish-speaking families that were joining us online. So that was really, there's, there's some logistics and some planning involved in that, but we encourage you to make that happen. Um, and then just the translation of documents. And um, we try to make sure that every training, every document, everything we have um, is also av available in Spanish. Um, if we have a family that, um, you know, needs ASL interpretation or captioning or whatever, um, those are things we ask on our registration as well. So we have a partnership with our newborn hearing screening program, so as, as well as our Department of Rehabilitation Services. So if we have someone who needs ASL interpretation between the two of them, we can usually meet that need um, by, uh, by them providing that for us. 
And then just communication. Um, communication is key to so many things. And so communicating through the planning of it, communicating, um, you know, your save the date, um, getting that out in advance so people can put that on their calendar and um, communication is key. Evaluation and data is another big one. I am not like an expert in any of this, which is why we have partners. Um, and so one of our partners with the Center for Learning and Leadership, our University Center for Excellence on Developmental Disabilities, has an evaluation staff. Um, so they helped us create our evaluation. And the first one was created several years ago. And every year we just kind of modify that to fit the needs for the conference that year. So we'll just go in and have them update the keynote speaker sessions or if our breakout sessions look a little different. And they really are instrumental in helping us with that evaluation piece. And then they pull that all together for us and provide a nice summary for us to share with our planning committee. And we use those evaluations um, in our planning going forward, you know. Um, if someone has something negative to say, we want to look at that. We want to see how we can make improvements. Um, also, the day of the conference, um, when we were doing it in person, which we'll get back to doing this this year, um, we would have a debrief meeting right after the conference. So as soon as we got everybody out the door, the planning committee would plan on staying an hour after because that's when things are fresh on your brain, right? Or that's when you've heard somebody make a comment. If you have a conference on a Friday and you go home and you've got your weekend filled with family stuff and all kinds of things, you're going to forget some of those little nuggets. So we try to meet right after the conference and download everybody's brain um, at that time and capture um, things that you know went well, things that didn't go well, things like that. And that helps us too with our evaluation process. And then partnering with agencies that have a real strength in data will be really helpful too. You know, a lot of times as families, we don't know quite the right way to ask questions, but um, if you have someone that has an epidemiologist or someone that just uh, specializes in developing surveys, they can really help you figure out how to ask it in a way that isn't leading, that you're really asking good questions and the right questions. And if you have good goals for the conference as well, it's much easier to set up your evaluation because if you know what your end result is, then you can set those um, questions up based on that. I'm going to turn here so I can see. I know I was thinking it's kind of a hard, <laughs> it's kind of a hard, hard way to do that. So this is actually a picture of, I think it was the second Joining Forces Conference. We were doing it at a tech center here in Oklahoma City. Um, so partnerships and actions, what does it do? So when you have part, these partnerships, what happens? Um, it increases the value of family organizations. I'll tell you, when we first started doing Joining Forces, the very first year, the very first meeting, um, what happened was, you know, we're at a table, right? This big boardroom table. I know I remember it just like it was yesterday and all the providers or all the agency people walked down one side of the table and all the family leaders walked down the other side of the table. Now, when we get to do in-person, which we haven't done an in-person planning meeting in a while, but before COVID, when you walked in, when you walk in now, you have no idea unless you look at their name tags, who's with a family organization or who's a parent and who the, the agency providers or professionals are because we're all in this together. And they re realize not only is this helping their organizations better meet the needs of the families that they're serving, but they're checking a box from a federal perspective because I don't know one single agency at the federal level that doesn't require the voice of the people that are being served. And so when you walk up to them and say, you know, I've heard that you might um, have a, a federal requirement that you have to have some kind of voice of the people you're serving as you're planning and developing and evaluating your program. Well, we have an idea for this great conference they do in Oklahoma every year. Would you be willing to be part of the planning committee? We don't want any money. That's what we told them, wasn't it, Heather? The first couple of years, we, said, we don't want your money. It's okay. We're going to do this on a shoestring budget. You know, someone donated the uh, tech center and OFN came up with the money for the food. We did a little fundraiser. We sold t-shirts. 
you know, you sell a shirt for 20 bucks, you pay seven for it. So you got somebody's lunch there just because someone bought a t-shirt. So we just do all kinds of things. Now, since then, the agencies, excuse me, have figured out this is very valuable and it looks good in their reports that they're doing this. And so if we can help them meet a need, they're going to be more willing to be at the table and then they might actually come to the table with a little cash. Yeah, it's worked. It's worked. Um, one of the things that came out of it, one of the outcomes that has come out of this that I never anticipated is the mentoring of us as family leaders from agency staff. You know, I had one in particular, she's retired now, Susanna Dooley, who was director of maternal and child health. You know, I, I mean, I came in like gangbusters. I mean, I'm kind of, I can be overwhelming. And she's like, you got to back off, girl. It's going to take it. They have so much red tape. I can't even have you come in my building right now. You know, it's just, I got to figure out how to get it approved so you can, you can come in my office. So, you know, and, and I didn't understand that. I just thought they were being, really, you know, they didn't want us a part of their meetings, but they had to go through a lot of processes to even get us to where we could be on there. Trailer, our Medicaid, state Medicaid director mentioned this morning, I'm on the medical advisory committee. We actually have another very strong um, developmental disabilities advocate that is on it as well. And you all, it was people behind the scenes that made sure that happened. Because I had to get approved. Well, first of all, you had to be approved by the governor. I don't know how in the heck that happened, but um, so you had to be approved by the governor. But I either had to be appointed by the Speaker of the House or whatever, you know, it, it's one of those. And I don't know, they never told me who, who they actually talked into letting me be on the medical advisory committee. But the fact that we have a committee of 15 and two of us are advocates. I'm an advocate more in the area of mental health. And then Wanda is more in the area of intellectual and developmental disabilities. So it's been huge. But if I hadn't had Susanna Dooley telling me way back when, back off, Jack, we're going to work on this, but you're going to have to step back just a tiny bit and calm this down. Let's figure out what some little baby steps we can take. Let's get some wins. Let's let this happen well, and then, then we'll go from there. So, um, Family leaders were identified for committees and boards. Um, our developmental disability services actually came to us and said, we have two openings on our policy committee, and we want families. We want you, because we see you pick good families to come to the conference. You all, we're careful who gets to come to this conference. It's a little more open now, but when we first started it, we had a tight leash. If you didn't get invited, you didn't come. We were very careful because we had to build that relationship with the agencies. I mean, we went over backwards to do anything we could so that we didn't offend the agency. But at the same time, get your voice heard so that they, they saw we were in it for the right reason. And, and then they, they really opened up. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I think we ought to let Heather answer that because she's never lost a grant like I have because I opened my mouth at a meeting. <laughs> Like get ready or, you know, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to repeat your question. And um, so, uh, members of the audience want to know: Do we kind of sift through, kind of look at what family leaders we want at the table? We did greatly at the beginning. We still do now. Don't get me wrong, but they'll see it on our on our website or our Facebook page that we're having it. But we outreach. So, like, we go to people and say, "We need you at this conference." You know, we would really like for you to be on the Preparing for a Lifetime, which is a maternal child health initiative. You would have a great voice there. And so we want you here and we want to make sure that you're in their session. So some of that happens. And then. Yeah. And, and like Joni said, early on, we were, it was really by invitation only, you know, who could come to joining forces because we did not want that family 
who, who was just going to come and bring their issue to the table and be that voice that was overshadowing and overpowering, which we know can happen, especially if a family's like in the middle of a crisis or, you know, they need something fixed right then and there for their family. This was not the time or place for that. So we were very clear about that. I think it goes back to, honestly, those relationships that you have with families that you've been working with that you know, um, you know, are going to come with that broad perspective, not just to fix their issue or their challenge or their problem at that time. So it really goes back to relationships to me and also just training, you know, training ahead of time. Um, with our organization, we have what we call a support parent training. Um, and those are families that support other families. And it's a, like a five or six hour training on confidentiality and, you know, all of these basic things. But it's also an opportunity for our staff to really get to know that family. And, and you know, within the first 15 minutes, typically of meeting someone, if, if they're there just to fix their problem or if they truly, you know, want to share their experience and make the system better and and be broader in their scope of trying to um, partner. Um, so I think relationships is a huge thing. There's so many great trainings out there. I know Diana Atin is here from New Jersey and she has the serving on boards and committees training um, that I think is a really great foundational training for families to start serving in that leadership role and truly getting that partnership piece. So they're not just that, you know, loud mom or dad voice at the table that, you know, people just don't really want to partner with because, you know, they're, they're not in a good place to be able to do that. So in the first, especially the first few years, we haven't done them lately because of COVID and money mostly, but we were doing regional institutes. We recognize families can't always come to Oklahoma. Oklahoma City is right in the middle of the state, which is helpful, but they can't always leave their kids, you know, and back then we didn't have Zoom. I don't think Zoom, I think we had freecommercecall.com, but we didn't have Zoom at that point. And so we didn't really have a way to make a hybrid conference. And we said, you know, we need to take this out to the rural areas. And so we took some of the foundational training, like um, one of the core uh, trainings is family professional partnerships, the ABCs or the science of, if you will. And so we had our developmental disabilities uh, division director and I would co-present and we would do that session. And so we would invite professionals and families to that. So we were kind of doing mini joining forces conference. And then when we met families out there, we would say, we want you to come to the state conference. You would be great. You know, and then we would find a way to get them there. You need money for gas. You need a hotel. We're going to figure out how to get you there. In the early conferences, I think the first one was like 131 people. And our, our goal wasn't to get a bazillion people there, you all. You can make change with five. I mean, you really can. If you have people in the agency that buy into these partnerships, and then you have families that will bring not only their voice, but the voice of their community or people who have kids with behavioral health concerns, so that you're really getting a lot of feedback just when that one person comes, then those professionals start trusting not just Heather and me, but they start trusting I can trust whoever they bring to that conference. They're not going to corner me. Or if they did, the first two years, we had bouncers, basically. <laughs> and if we saw someone go after trailer, we we're like, uh-uh, not in my conference. You set that aside. In our conference agenda, it says very clearly, if you have a beef with an agency, today is not the day to bring it up. Today is the day to bring solutions and ideas for partnership. And we did. I mean, there were probably 10 of us. And I mean, one of them got really hot. And I just walked right over to that family member. And I said, excuse me, you need to come with me. You know, do you need to leave? Or can you, I would love for you to stay, but you can't stay with this kind of behavior. We would also, when we did them in person, which we'll do this again this year, now that we're going getting back into person, we would have comment cards on the table. So, and we would tell families up front or even agencies um, that were there, professionals that were there, if you have a comment or a complaint or something you need to have an agency or an individual, you know, get back to you on um, after the conference, they could leave those comment cards on the table. And then we would distribute those to the appropriate agency representation that was there that day. So they could follow up with that family afterwards to address any issues or concerns or, and or individual questions. And all the agencies yeah. agreed that they would contact that person within two weeks and they did. They did because we do want everyone's needs to get met. 
check that exactly check that to make sure that they we did that. actually we had a comment card and and it flowed back to us to tell us what happened how yeah how did that get resolved and the planning committee played a big role in making sure that that happened. Because again, if you have somebody from every child serving agency on the planning committee, it was their job. If they're a part of the planning committee, it is your job to get the answer to that question or help serve that family that has a barrier to accessing services. And they did. I mean, they still do it today. It's, it's great. Um, I mentioned the institutes. We took them to the rural. I think we got all that. So out, outcomes um, for the first, oh, this was one of our moms that said, for the first time ever, I feel the agency has heard my concerns, appears to have genuine concern, and are acting upon the input that we provide. I love being a part of this group. We're making a difference. And that was a mom from a frontier area of Oklahoma with adopted children with behavioral health and other needs. And this is our... Um, well, it's most of the current members of our Medicaid Family Advisory Council. So, um, and there's outcomes always that we don't anticipate, right? It's just that ripple effect process. It's like, oh my gosh, that's really cool that that happened because of joining forces or because the same people were in the same room. Um, and so some of the outcomes and ripple effects that we've seen from the conference is we've identified and been able to train more supporting parents for our organization. You know, family leaders that we didn't even know existed because for whatever reasons, our paths hadn't crossed. Um, and then more trained family partners, families and professionals partnering together on other coalitions and partnership opportunities. So it's not just, it, it is a day conference, but it's not just where the magic happens. It is a continuation of joining forces and partnerships throughout the remainder of the year. Um, and then continued partnerships for grants and funding. Um, there's been funding opportunities identified, not only for our organization, but for other nonprofits that we're sitting at the table. Um, we have a partner out in Poto um, who has been you know, instrumental in our joining forces conferences as a family leader years ago. He was on our staff years ago. Now he's out in rural Oklahoma with his own federal grant and his own nonprofit organization because of partnerships developed through places like joining forces and, and just meeting people to help support him in that. Um, and then needs assessments, focus groups, um, also just identifying more diverse populations, um, those underserved populations. Um, I mentioned, you know, we try to make sure that everything's provided um, in the, in the uh, language or communication method that people need that in. Um, you know, just partnering with um, grandparents and siblings. I mean, that's another population too. And the youth voice. Um, I reached out this week to... Um, some of our partners just to get some input and a quote for them from about joining forces. And she provided me with this big long quote and she's like, cut it down however you want. And then at the bottom of the email, it said, oh, and by the way, I, could you partner with us to get more family, um, family input on our youth voice at our local and community um, rural areas? And I was like, okay. So sometimes it's just reaching out to ask for something and then that makes them feel like, oh yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you contacted me because we need you to help us do this. And the partnerships go back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Our state agencies don't have Zoom. Yeah. They have to use, what's it called? They use Teams. They use Teams. And so we actually, yeah, we set up Zooms for them. I mean, to us, it's no sweat off our backs. We already have the Zoom accounts. But for them, one of our staff that's real involved with our Department of Health, she is totally in the middle of the Youth and Adolescent Summit now because they needed our Zoom account, basically. So it can be a good thing. And I mean, you all, you're paying, you're paying for Zoom anyway, yeah. you know? So it's like, and then you can reach out and support them as well. And they are really appreciative. Yeah, that was one of the things she put in her quote too. So uh -huh. it's a win-win for us all. Right. I think, right, there's this, there's this awful truth of like, well, we don't know why they have a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't respond. So it's really nice to see the reputation you know to be able to expand on your experience. Okay, and, and so the, the comment from the audience was, we're trying to build a reputation for be the for being the place to go when people want families or youth to be on a council or an advisory. We're not there yet. Now, there are certain agencies we are there. 
but there are a lot of agencies. We're still not there yet. Our child welfare system, they don't trust anyone. It's really sad. <laughs> right. Well, and if nothing else, I shame them into it. I'm not opposed to that at all. I'll totally shame them. Totally shame them. So. So this is just kind of a timeline of um, our conferences throughout the years. Um, Joni mentioned our first conference with Eileen Ferlenza, who is an outstanding family leader. And if you go to our website right now and um, under advocacy, there's a joining forces tab. If you go to OklahomaFamilyNetwork.org um, and you can um, look at all the sessions. She was our keynote speaker again last year. Um, and we brought her into Oklahoma to kind of do a refresh of when we first started and Last year was our 15th year, so we're like, what better time to bring back our first ever keynote speaker for our 15th celebration. Um, so if you go to our website now, you can watch her presentation on our YouTube channel. It's oklahomafamilynetwork.org. And yes, it's long. That's how our email addresses are too. <laughs> so once you spell it out, is there anything else happening? No, it's just .org. Yeah, yeah. So if you go there under joining forces, you can see, I think our last three years of keynote speakers, um, all of their sessions are on the website. And then there's documents and things like that on there too. And we'll just keep updating that as we go. Rhiannon here is our uh, guru on our website. So um, she kind of helps us keep all that organized and fresh so that we are very appreciative of her for that. Um, and then in 2019, um, we brought in Nancy DeVenere and just talked about skills needed to be a good partner. Um, and then we brought Eileen back again in 2010. Um, and so you can just kind of see the progression of that. But every single year, the focus does not change. It's all about partnerships and modeling those partnerships and how can we make these partnerships better and improve upon those. Um, and then um, I don't know, how many, of you, how many of you in the room are familiar with the life course tools, charting the life course tools? Love them. If you're not familiar, um, I would encourage you to go to Charting the Life Course. Um, it Charting the Life Course. Um, yeah, this afternoon. This afternoon, we're going to show you one of the tools from Charting the Life Course. Um, but they are great tools. They were really developed um, initially for people to use with, that have intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities. But you guys, they're so practical for any family, any organization, anyone to use. So we brought in Shelly Reynolds, who is the brainchild behind a lot of the tools. She's based out of the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Um, but it's just, it's a great, it's a great, great thing to be able to use in planning, in working with families. Um, so she came to our conference in 2016 and really did a deep dive into the life course tools. Um, and that was a great, a great conference, great year. Um, and then um, last year, um, again, I said we brought back Eileen Belinza. Um, 2020, we had to do a quick shift. Within three weeks, we had Dr. Chan Hellman. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Dr. Hellman. He is one of the co-authors of The Science of Hope. If you haven't read that book highly encourage you to read it. It's kind of a tough read. I mean, it took me a long time because it's a lot to digest and process, but it is such a great, um, just a great dive into the history and the science of hope. And hope is a huge word that we use within our organization and use when we're working with families, because if we don't have hope, sometimes we don't have hardly anything left, right? So we want to help provide that hope. So Dr. Hellman and his keynote is also on our website, on our YouTube channel. Um, so he, he was very gracious in our quick shift from going from an in-person conference to a hybrid conference. We quickly learned that how to use Zoom. I mean, we had used it a few little times for meetings here and there, but we quickly learned how to use it. Um, did a quick shift, increased our Zoom capacity for 500 participants, and we had people on a wait list to hear him. I mean, that was our biggest attendance conference year. I mean, if, you know, we had 500 people max, and if somebody jumped off, somebody else was jumping right back on to fill their spot. I mean, it was very well received, and he let us record that session, which was very, very generous of him because he is nationally renowned, internationally renowned speaker on the science of hope. Um, and then in 2021, we also did a virtual, and we had the um, Fostering Belonging. Um, Eric Carter, Dr. Eric Carter, if any of you guys are familiar with him um, and his um, 
you know, just his speaking on belonging and the science of belonging, that's a really great message as well that goes really kind of along with that hope message too. Um, but we have two professors here in state at the Oklahoma State University who work very closely with him and do a lot of work around the science of belonging. Um, and they were our keynote speakers um, in 2021. So just kind of a timeline. We had one of our partners when we were doing, um, this was our 10 year, um, I believe anniversary, I think. Um, she's super creative and she put together this fun little timeline with all these stars around it that kind of highlighted some of the outcomes of years past conferences. And we had this hanging up at our conference one year so people could go by and kind of just look at that roadmap of joining forces and, and how far we had come. And um, anyway, it was great. So this is, um, Jody mentioned t-shirts. We, um, we've done t-shirts where we charge a little bit extra for a t-shirt and use that money to kind of, you know, help pay for lunches or whatever. And I will tell you, it's been so fun because on so many Zoom meetings that we've had um, over the last couple of years, we get on and like our partners are like, I'm wearing my t-shirt. I'm wearing my t-shirt. This is my favorite t-shirt I have in my, in my closet, but it has our really nice little colorful logo on it. And one year, this was a quote that we had on the back of our t-shirts, um, which really, I think, sums up the reason why we're doing joining forces. And like Joni said, um, when Susanna Dooley said, hold on, sister, like we know with state agency and government agency, things don't always go fast. But if you look at this, um, we can't always go fast, but we've got to do it together to get far. So yeah, we've got some quotes from some partners. We really wanted to have a little video of one of our partners talking, but that didn't happen. I think it was like a nine month process that you initially they sent me, you all sent me an email and hey, we heard your voice at the Northeast side of Oklahoma City and we're trying to get involved. This is what we're trying to do. And that they asked me first and then they provided me with this is what you're going to have to do. This is what you're going to have to do if you want to do it. And so, so it, when it was a, a not a, a tedious thing, it just kind of asked you questions like, why are you passionate? What can you bring to the community? And things like that. So I really appreciated it. And now we're just now kicking it off on the ground and everything. But um, like you said, we don't want families coming in and just rambling off. Like, what do you have? When, what I took out of that is that they asked me, what do you have to offer? What are you going to bring to the table to find the solution? Um, so kudos to Johnny for, for that. <laughs> And me being able to be a part of one of your partners. Um, and then uh, the Oklahoma, I wanted to touch on the Oklahoma, the HOPE initiative, how we all, most of our agencies were asked to go through the HOPE initiative and the <laughs> for Chan Hellman is rise, HOPE Rising. And they to become a HOPE Navigator, I'm a HOPE Navigator. So I'm able to go out in the science of HOPE and we do assessment on where, what level is your, where is your level of hope at? And is it skill versus will? The pathways, the agents, what is what is uh, forbidding you? What is hindering you from getting to your goal? And how do we meet meet that? So thank you and kudos to that, but I just wanted to add that. Or an Oki girl. Okay, good to know. Well, and she was actually referring to um, we have a small grant with um, Evolution Foundation, one of our other partners, and it's a Thriving Family Safe for Children, if you've heard of that initiative. And in essence, it's getting the voice of minority families and underserved families. And in Oklahoma, our primor primary minority and underserved are Hispanic, tribal, African-American. Sorry. I'm like I'm having a brain freeze here. So, but we do an application because it's important that we find out, are you in this for the right reason? You know, they'll get into some of those questions and say, you know, how, how will you take this information back to your community? Well, if they stop the application right there, you know, they're not quite ready for that because this is an important initiative. We want the right people at the table. So. Thank you. 
And don't, don't be afraid to be particular. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. If you have a conference of 50 people and half are strong family leaders that are ready to partner and the other half are agencies, what a great start. You know, I, I remember standing at the back of that room at Moore Norman Technology Center and seeing all those agency leaders talking about family partnerships at their agency. I was standing in the back of the room. I had tears running down my face because I couldn't believe that it was happening. You know, and that was the very first year that we did it. And sometimes what you'll have to do is find someone, maybe not at the top. They need to have some influence so that they can go back and make change, right? But they don't necessarily have to be the director of the agency. Now, we had some division directors, and, and, that, and it's nice if you can get that level because they have the authority to go back and say, we are going to do this, whether you like it or not. And that's how, that's how real change can often happen. But even if you have to start with middle-level managers, don't worry about that. Because if you can get them drinking the Kool-Aid, they'll go back and tell their bosses. And then what we tried to do is go see their bosses with them and share our vision. And it's pretty hard to say, no, I think that's a bad idea. Because in essence, you're saying, I don't really care what the people we're serving think. <laughs> no one has the courage to say that. So it's time, it's energy, and it's really well worth it. Okay, I'm going to swing back around here. I want to stand in front of you. So I had the privilege of, just hold that. I had the privilege of going to the Maternal Child Health Public Health Leadership Institute. Well, anytime you can go to a leadership institute that one of the federal agencies develop, jump on it. I mean, it was the worst year of my life to be doing that because my daughter was graduating from high school. She has behavioral health concerns. She has all kinds of health issues. She had to have her gallbladder out. It was the worst year for me to do that. Um, and I was on a national board that year. It was just, it was like the year from, you know, where. But what it gave me was, because it was time consuming, but I had homework. And the thing that I decided to do is take all that stuff we learned from joining forces and develop a toolkit. And so you all have access, will have access to this toolkit now. And then yes, and you just take it and you just change it to yours. We do not care. The only thing I would ask is if, if you use a lot of our stuff, if you don't mind just saying that you, you know, you adapted it from Oklahoma Family Network or something like that. Our, our partners who help pay our bills, like, appreciate that. But this just shows you at a glance the different documents we've developed. So there's a family leader orientation agenda because those first two years that we did joining forces, we did an orientation. We sent them a packet, you know, that said, this is not, if you got a beef, don't come. Or you got to stuff it in your back pocket. You bring it to one of us or put it on a comment card. And we promise someone with authority will get back with you in two weeks. So it's really important that you orient these families or you vet them in a way so that you know they're going to be safe to be there. And they're not going to beat up your State Department of Education special education director because she was the one that had the big target on her forehead. Um, there's a family leader request form. And so it asks, what does this family need to know? Who's the audience? Where do they park? Is there accessible parking? Um, who's going to meet them at the door and help them get there? Who's the audience? How many will be there? How how should they dress? You know, is there funding for this person? All of those documents, you all, we've already developed it all. Now, what you can do is you can take what we've developed and just build on it. You know, I'm a firm believer in just stealing from other people. I'm shameless in that way. But you always give them credit, right? That's what we've done. Um, there's a so not only a family leader form, but a speaker form. And so, because a family leader, they may want them to be on an advisory. Well, we need to know, are you paying them? If they take off work, you better be paying them. And then by the way, they might need childcare. And they also might need a little gas card so they can get there. So we get all that information up front. So when we take it to the family and say, we think you would be a good, we basically match them to the, you know, it's like, we know this family, they're a support parent, they're a family leader that we know. And then we say, we think you would be a good match for this, but can you afford to do this? Because they have no stipend, they have no gas, they have no nothing, you know. But oh, then, I don't need someone to do something if I don't at least give them a little something. Usually we'll give them 50, especially if they have to go in person. I'm not going to give them less than 50. It's been worth leaving. 
your house for 50, you know, less than $50. And we usually do the Walmart cards. Although lately we found out our bank, if we don't ask too often, they'll do free gift cards, Visa cards, and the families really like those. Although some of them just say, nah, give me a Walmart card. Um, we have conference planning committee, just like we didn't use like the name Center for Learning Leadership. You wouldn't know who that was in your state. It's the University Center for Excellence on Developmental Disabilities. So it's just a list of different people you might want to have on your planning committee, just to give you some ideas. Um, we have a, a conference agenda that we have sample agenda we've used in the past, a sample evaluation. And then the family opportunity form is a form that the agencies filled out. And we actually did this. Well, it's kind of like a Google form, but it was one of our partners actually developed it for us. So I think, I don't remember what that program's called, but in essence, you could do it on a Google form where they literally, the agency says, I have, here's the contact. This is their address. This is their name. This is their phone number. And this is what we need. And it tells family leaders. So if we're at joining forces doing roundtables or breakout sessions, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services could pass that out. And say, here's the opportunities we have right now. Do you want to apply for that? Or do you want to talk to me about it? So you're getting information back and forth. You're getting the information from the families to the agencies that they can choose from. And then the agencies are letting the families know what, what opportunities are available. And then the family leader interest inventory. This sucker is so long. But I don't know how to make it shorter. Because every family has such great lived experience. But basically what it does is it says, what do you know about? And then what are you willing to give? Because I was a pharmaceutical rep before I was a family advocate. And so I have a level of knowledge because of that, that I bring to the table as a professional in that way. And then, you know, maybe I'm a good speaker. Maybe I'm an accountant. Maybe accounting is my day job. And maybe I would be a good treasurer for a board. You know, that kind of thing, because we all need people with that kind of, we want their lived experience, but we also need their expertise. We need them for our boards, don't we? So there's the sample agenda. This was our original stipend form. I mean, see how simple that is, you all. It's just what they do, what was the date, how many days, and then usually what, what we've done in the past is a flat $50 for a for a day, or if it went over four hours or so, and if it's less than four hours, then we would give them 25. We're having to bump that up because it costs so much to for gas and all of that. We we do a little bit better, and a lot of times now we um will actually uh, what was I going to say? Probably lost that. But if you look down in the right hand corner, we even mark where's the funding coming from. Is it federal? Is it state? Is it healthcare authority? Is it Department of Mental Health? And then that helps our accounting people. Now all of that is in a Google form. And we actually are giving you the link to that form so you can see it. That, that's sent to them, emailed to them, and then you emailed them for a Yep. Or if it's in person, um, now we've gotten all smart because Heather and Rihanna know how to do all this stuff. But now we just like, we'll print uh, postcards with a QR code and we just walk over and hand them that. So it's not so obvious. And then they just click on it and then they fill it out. And then I hand them the card if it's in person. If it's on Zoom, we just mail them the card. And usually we buy foldover cards with our logo and I write them a nice note. Because I'm telling you, I appreciate they took the time to do that. And usually if they said something that I really appreciated, I will mention that. People don't write handwritten notes anymore. And since we can't see them in person, I figure if I write them a note, at least that's a little something. Yeah, and we've done those electronic gift cards too. It, it's really what the preference of the family is. We have some families that prefer an ACH or something. So we, you know, connect them with our business manager and um, electronic. Direct, basically, it's just like deposit. a direct deposit from our bank to their bank. Yeah. So you can so either, if they want that, we connect them to our business manager. So we just kind of the preference of the mm -hmm. family. If you don't shop at Walmart, a Walmart gift card is not going to do you good, right? So if you want an Amazon gift card, we could probably swing that. So yeah, we just kind of figure that out. 
So we just try to listen to our leaders and whatever they say. It is amazing though. A lot of them still just want a plastic Walmart card, you know? Um, I think this is true. Yeah, so this is, um, we, we threw this slide in here because this is really gonna be the focus of our Joining Forces Conference this year. Um, it's the seven, seven partner values that were created um, by our University Center for Excellence on Developmental Disabilities. Dr. Val Valerie Williams is going to be our keynote talking about these how they were developed. They were developed with not only family leaders at the table, but self-advocates at the table, which is another piece of our Joining Forces Conference. We, nothing without, nothing about us without us, right, is their motto. Um, and so we have um, self-advocates on our planning committee for Joining Forces, and then they are involved in that day, which also brings another level of accommodations sometimes. Um, we found out this past year on our evaluation um, that we really need to have some emojis on like our scale of like, were you satisfied with this? A big oh happy face. Were you not satisfied? Because some of our self-advocates um, were confused as, as the evaluation was um, provided this year as to what, what a 10 meant versus what a one meant. Yeah. I thought I silenced my watch. So, and then Joni, this is the zip file. If you wanna scan that QR code, that'll take you to all of those documents that she's mentioned. Um, and not your slides, so I don't want to steal your thunder. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to just click on that, that'll take you right to it. It's just Google Doc. It's a folder. It's a zip file. And then if you download this presentation, that's a live link, too. So if you'd rather access that on your computer um, and do it that way. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Good. Yeah. And I'll take it. Yeah, there. that's great. Yeah. I know we don't even really need our laptops anymore, except my eyes are too bad. I can't see on my phone. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, then you'll do that. Yep. Okay. Did everybody get it? Yeah. And if you didn't, um, if you contact us, our contact information is here. And it's also. I don't need to fix that. Yeah. Um, I don't either. It didn't look like that when we first came. Good. Good. Good to know. But, and if you have any questions, I mean, we, we're really happy to receive questions today. But, you know, if you go home and you think, oh, I wonder how they did this. Oops. I'm not. Uh -huh. The QR code? Sure. I wanted just to say that I really appreciate you sharing about um, the extent of the efforts that you go to to make sure when family leaders come or look at issue how they want to show up that you provide that information. You know, I think that's really important. Um, in my state, in one of the situations that I have, is that it's a struggle for me to get um, our system folks and our parents all in the same room consistently. And it's a part of my job to make sure that this happens and bringing the community and our systems together. And um, I was struggling to really Get that make that happen without it being a power situation. Um, and that's the reason why I'm like, we got to figure this out because every time we food, get to there. Food, food. Right. Always have, I'm telling you all. Yeah. How, even if you soon. have to make yeah. sandwiches at yeah. home and take it. We would bake brownies, wouldn't we, Heather? I would make cookies. I have made blueberry muffins. I mean, I do not show up without food. And if I don't have any money, I'll just make them at home and take them. Yeah. Yeah, food, food yeah. changes everything. I I I have I have money. I have food. I have all of those things for them. That's not that's not the problem. No, not the leader. I got the system, folks. I have the MCOs, our managed care organizations, at the table. I work for the our county government, our behavioral health, our community. It's about being able to. Um, get the trust 
to build a relationship to trust so that they'll be in a place where they want to be able to be there and see where their voice is important to be there. So I have to spend a lot of time time you know I'm looking for those champions like some of those champions have then moved on or left so building um some new champions some new leaders to come into and say and go into those communities is where I'm at now it's really trying to get there and it's a struggle because we want to be able to you know we have those ones that come in the door like you said and you got to like have a bodyguard for them right <laughs> their motives are very different right and when you were the account when you were the county like I, I have to be careful about who I bring to a meeting or say, come to this meeting because they're going to go straight to it. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, we're not doing Do that. Deep. People weren't getting COVID tested and refused to get vaccine on the northeast side of Oklahoma City. So what happened was they came to where the people were coming church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they came to where they were going church food banks um where where are they going what is it that they need and so these organizations came to where the people were going where where they to get where they, could get where they could get their needs met okay if they're going to this church to get these COVID tests who's over that well I happen to be the forerunner over that Mm -hmm. And I was adamant about getting out there and say, hey, we got to get tested, going door to door and things like that. Oh, okay, well, she's out there doing that. So let me see how she's getting people to come to that. And then let's partner with them and bring them in. And but that's I, how but I would, I would I add, is this still on? Um, I would add for us, the parent to parent matching is the cradle of leadership okay you start with the model we use is if you're matching people with like experiences for support then you get to kind of watch them and see how are they mentoring that person because we would follow up and talk to the support parent and talk to the referred family and say how did that go and when you see people going above and beyond i mean we had families that would go pick people up and take them places or go see them take three buses to get to the hospital to see that family you know whether a child was having you know surgery or something like that um being a to me that is priceless that's that's how we get to know the families really well and there are times when agencies can recommend people, but you have to be really careful because sometimes they'll recommend someone they think is going to sue them. You know, well, that's, you know, she was talking about, we do kind of that interview process and it's not huge or anything. It's just kind of getting to know them a little bit. And you can know in a heartbeat, that's probably not something when you're going to want it, especially not at your first conference, the first one you have, you have to be really careful. You have to protect those agency leaders as best as you can, because we didn't want them to say, I'm never coming back to this again. I mean, really what Jim Nicholson said, he was the head of developmental disability services right before he retired. I went up to his office. I think we gave him an award or something and he wasn't there. So I don't know. Anyway, I had to go up to his office and he said, I want to tell you something. Your group is the first time I saw it was safe to partner with families. And that's because of all the work that we did behind the scenes. We're not perfect. Believe me, I lost a couple of grants one time with one sentence and I didn't let our Department of Education person open her mouth until I got out what I said, but it was worth it. We never took money from him again. I was like, I don't want your money the way you behave, but she's gone now. But anyway, he's probably a real nice guy there. But um, anyway, it's just, you know, being, being, being careful, being cautious, you know, connecting them in the room with someone that's a little more, we did that a few times where if we had a brand new family leader, we would say, Wanda, this girl has real interest in developmental disabilities. You hang with her. Joni, she's mental health. You hang with her. And that kind of thing really is helpful. And I'm sorry, we haven't given you a chance. Okay. I just a quick question. Is the disclaimer in those documents that you shared, the disclaimer that you had for families, is, is it in the toolkit? Oh, that they need to be quiet? Yeah. It's on the agenda, I think. Okay. So I think it's on the agenda. Like it if, if, it, if it isn't. I could email you. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll send you the, like one of the original ones Perfect. and, and we we'll put our full agenda and I'm not sure I put the full agenda. I think I did the agenda at a client, so it may not be in there, but I'm more than glad to send it to you. And we put it in there almost every year, My second, maybe every year. I have year. two more questions. I think mm -hmm. it's quick. Um, the family Institute, did you create a uh, leadership Institute? Did you create a toolkit for that? A toolkit for that. Um, you know, we haven't, because in essence, what we did is we took the nuts and bolts of joining forces and took it on the road, basically. Okay. okay. So now if you wanted like, um, oh my gosh, we've done so many regional institutes. So we kind of do two different kinds. And usually what we do is we go in and do the joining forces one first, mm -hmm. and it's just a little over half a day. Okay. And like tribes have paid for the lunch. I mean, we've just found all kinds of people very generous, willing to pay for the lunch because if they leave at lunch, they don't, they might not come back. And so, but we don't do it too long, just like three or four hours. And then the last question I have, I'd love to know over the years, what was your first budget mm -hmm. and where are you at now and what you need? Because again, and I really yeah. respect, and we do the same thing, free for families. Mm -hmm. So, and give scholarships to providers that actually don't have the money to pay. Our first one and was nine hundred dollars. It was probably yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like it was nine hundred dollars, I think, for the first one, and it was because we paid um, half to do the food. And, and then we had, maybe we didn't do food. No, we, we did food. I don't know. But the first one, everything except the food was about $900 because, well, no, we had Eileen. Somebody paid for Eileen to come. It was like $3,500 or something. I don't know. Um, the one that we just. So we just did hybrid. Yeah. yeah. It still wasn't much. Well, it was bigger than normal because we had one of our state agencies had some extra dollars um, this past year with, um, I don't know if it was ARPA fund. I don't remember. We did a pie in the sky. We did a pie. I dumped $19,000 on our plate and we spent every penny of it. Yeah. But we did, yes, but we did it virtual. So that helped us pay for the Whova app. That helped us pay for, um, you know, the technology that we needed. It helped us get it up. We yeah. had to up our Zoom accounts. When you have four breakouts going at a time, that's four Zoom sessions mm -hmm. that have to be able to manage 300. Yeah. So, and that helps pay for the translators in Spanish on Zoom yeah. and in person. And, then we, and inter we translated yeah. all the materials yeah. into Spanish. So, I mean, there was a lot there. Um, and we've always translated into Spanish. Of course, when they were only in person, we would have these little... It was terrible. They look like little ducks. So like we had one translator with an FM systems for all the families and they all had to go to the same group. I mean, but it, you know, you have to start somewhere. Now on Zoom, it's much easier because we've had as many as four sessions going at once. I don't know that I'll ever do that online again, because that was a nightmare trying to have four translators and make sure you have four people running the Zoom that know how to tell the translator how to get on how to tell the people to get on. And it's, um, that was a lot. Three, three is kind of two more managed. Two makes me yeah. feel more comfortable, but three, yeah. three at the max. But last year was our most expensive ever oh, conference wow. because we did it high, a true hybrid model. So with we hadn't spent all their ARPA money. And she was like, so I know you're doing, we were doing, it was a family matters conference. It was just family conference with all different types of skill building and one, one track was leadership, but then the rest of it was just stuff you guys do all the time. And, um, and we had a keynote and all of that. And she was like, what could you do? I don't, I don't think she said I, she had 19,000, but I knew it was a lot. One of her partners just didn't come through and then money had to be spent by the end of September. And our conference was like September the 27th. I said, don't worry. We're going to spend every dime of it. And we did, but I mean, we did boxes filled with shred yeah. and cups and hot chocolate yeah. and we did I little mean, like care packages basically yeah. for everyone that was attending virtually Zoom. and yeah. so you know we wanted to make them feel like they were there yeah, yeah. 
but no, I, you could do it. If you have like this year, it will be very inexpensive. Yeah. Cause we're not having to pay for our keynote speaker. She's here locally. She's volunteering her time. Um, so that's just an in-kind contribution. Um, a lot of times, like we have partners that have ink pens that provide the ink pens or the bags, they provide the bags. So we just take any of that in-kind, um, contributions. Um, it doesn't always have to be money, you know? Um, so yes. And the agency that I sit on the parent advisory board with, it's Allegheny Family Network in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it's actually all of the parents are here. There's like five of us, one of us couldn't come, but they wanted it to be in an experience, like a training experience. And they wanted me to come. Well, AFN, and I, I can understand it because they supported us last year. They gave us chairs. They had gave us like a lunch bag and um, like they gave us everything that we needed to be comfortable for the hybrid conference last year. And she's like, nope, 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 nope. I'm going to get you guys there this year. So I asked her, did she want me to come to this training right here? Cause she's with us. And she's like, yeah, I, I really would like for you to go. Cause we sat in a training yesterday. And we're all getting certified to be able to teach other parents and to train other parents. So AFN staff really does support their parent advisory. And if they need outside help, they help me get my state ID. So they do support their parents and they do look for parent involvement. We work very closely with the board. And as a matter of fact, the parents that are here, we get to sit in on the next board meeting and present what we learned from this conference. Okay, I think we have about three minutes. Is that right? So I'm Texas and I work for the state. Um, and so this is very interesting for us because we're trying to figure out where our family organizations are that, will, that are good partners with other people. We'll say it that way. Yeah. Yes, well, we know them, but sometimes they're not good partners with other people. Um, and so we want to be able to all be partners with everybody, right? And we can, and we're the state, so we can't do it. And so um, we're trying to find that ways, but we're excited because we were just talking about like, hey, maybe we can come to you guys' conference next year to see how you guys do it. At the state level, we'll be able to help support in some sort of capacity, whether that's financial or not. Um, it all depends because our funding cycles every two years. Um, and so there's ways to do that. But like, I guess, is there any other tools like from a state level, like what are, you know, how can you help us kind of branch the, and get the word out? I know, for example, when she was talking about, um, you know, where do, where do we find families? We've had to actually at our state level, engagement is a part of what I do. It wasn't initially a part of my job description before, but it's what I'm used to doing because I work for CPS, um, Children's Protective Services, and I work for Health and Human Services now. So I've worked both there. Um, and so I kind of know the systems and how they operate. Um, and I want to figure out like from, from you guys' perspective, what can the states do to help support the conference? Again, financially, yes, but what are some other things that we can do to make sure we have the right people at the table, whatever it is you guys are needing, that we hear you and then we make it happen on our level. Um, what have state agencies what, what have state agencies done to support our network? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Um, so the question from the audience is, um, what is helpful from an agency perspective for a family organization? I would say the first thing is meet with them on a regular basis. You know, Heather and I get to meet with like our Title V um, on a monthly basis. They see us and they treat us as an equal. When they write the Title V block grant, our eyes are some of the last ones that are on it. They want us to read it 
and make sure that it makes sense, make sure they haven't missed anything, you know, and that kind of thing. I think those are really meaningful opportunities for families like us. Like we're better grant writers because we read the Title V block grant. You know, we learned how to write an abstract better because we see how they write theirs. We, I basically, every time we write our federal grant to HRSA, we use the, um, what's the needs assessment, the needs assessment, the needs assessment for the whole state that Title V uses in their grant. We lift from that because they've already updated all the data. They have census data in there. They have um, needs data, you know, population data and all that kind of thing. Because I don't know how to look that stuff up. I mean, I can dig around and spend hours and hours and hours, but they can do it in five minutes. So they actually even wrote our needs assessment section of our block grant a couple of cycles. And then once they got it where it was really good, then all I do is say, will you update these numbers for me? You know, so that it's not a huge time commitment. But I think mentoring us is huge. I have learned so much from Shamika, who you all saw today, from Trailer, from Terry Fritz, who used to have, you know, used to be at the Healthcare Authority where Trailer is. I have learned so much from them. Just being in their meetings, I learn a ton. You know, my staff tell me all the time, because I'm 61 years old, I'm 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 not planning on living until I, I mean, work until I die. I hope not anyway. Um, you know, and so what what my staff were like, can you just download your brain on a jump drive? No, but if you come with me to meetings, you're going to know everything that I know. And so if you're at an agency, what I would say is, if you know you're going to an important meeting, and, and we challenge our Joining Forces Planning Committee to do this, if you're going to an important meeting, take a family with you. If they're going to learn about how systems work or just get to know people that could really benefit their organization, that is probably one of the kindest thing agency leaders have ever done from my perspective. I don't know, Heather, you have other thoughts? It is. It really is. I, I would like to make a comment to your statement. It's not an answer, but I really appreciate your perspective because I was sitting here thinking, I love this model. It's already created, but one of my gaps is how to work with the state. And so just a, a, a deeper conversation using their model, you have the state voice and perspective that I don't have but I have the local community and organizations that saying we don't know how to connect with the state. So if we could just extend the conversation some kind of way, even if I could hear your concerns, I already have ideas this way mm -hmm. and we can kind of bridge that. So I want to connect and talk about that. This just meeting for coffee and I mean that kind of stuff is really meaningful. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Everybody else on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That's why meeting's so important. Well, thank you, you all. I think we've kept you a little bit late. Hopefully, you're still going to get lunch. <laughs>